Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where we celebrate the new year in the old way. So welcome to the new year, motherfuckers. That will make sense in a few minutes. Anyway, I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. And this is indeed a celebration. It's the spring equinox, rejuvenation, rebirth, everything's blooming, all that crap. And who better to invite to a celebration than your friends? And the one man guest list for this celestial soiree is my friend, and soon to be yours, Mr. Preston Gibbs. Preston is a professional astrologer and tarot reader from Plano, Texas, and his website, liminalastrology.com, is the portal to his prophecies. Preston and I are going to talk a bit about the equinox, what it means, and how we can work with its associated energy. We'll also get into his worldview, which plays well with the video game analogy we should all be familiar with by now. We also talk about thoughts being causative and how that fits in with simulation theory, pattern recognition as it relates to astrology and tarot, the impact of millennials on astrology, a little bit of science fiction, and some other things I'm probably forgetting. Also, the last 15 minutes or so, our Skype connection got a bit choppy, but it wouldn't be a New Year's party without a little memory loss and slurred communication towards the end. So if this sounds like you're kind of seen, grab your consciousness-altering agent of choice and open that mind so we can plant some thought seeds in that third eye. Enjoy. Preston Gibbs, my man. Welcome to the D program. How's it going, Ryan? I'm really excited to sit down for this. How are you doing today? I'm actually standing for this, but I'm doing pretty well, man. I'm doing pretty well. I was trying to think the other day when I started to to prep for this, like how we actually met. Was it on Twitter or was it through email? No, that's a good question. I don't know. It might have been email. I honestly have no idea. Yeah, I'm not yeah, well, sure what the. Uh, I think I emailed you something about um, uh, your show because I like your show so much. Yeah, that's the first thing I remember. I don't know if it was on Twitter or not, but we definitely interact on Twitter. I like seeing when you tweet out your your horoscopes because I find them to be pretty beneficial. So uh, thanks for being here again. And you know, I want to start somewhere. So bear with me here, all right? So. I remember the last New Year's Eve party I went to, which was actually a few years ago. I stopped going out for shit like that. But this party I was at, this this one dude, obviously shit-faced, got up on a table as the ball was dropping. As everyone was counting down, as, as the clock struck midnight, he yelled out, Welcome to the New Year, motherfucker! And then jumped off toward a group of people who I assume he thought was going to catch him. But they did not. <laughs> They did not catch him, and he face-planted on the floor, and I laughed and laughed and laughed, and this dude was in his 40s, by the way, and this is why I stopped going out for New Year's Eve, Uh, (laughs) but regardless, since then, I've always expressed his sentiment to people when I can, so Preston Gibbs, happy official New Year to you. Welcome to the Equinox, motherfucker. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Don't jump off of, uh, you know, a stand and (laughs) do it like uh, just face-plant on the ground. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Well, I mean, you know, give it a few hours here. So (laughs) let's talk a bit about that, that event, the spring equinox. I have seen this described as the physical new year. And and what I have gathered that this means is that you need to, I guess, keep watering what you've planted in your life recently. And you got to make sure you're also watering yourself, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And as an astrologer and a, a man of general esoterics, What say you about the spring equinox? What advice do you have for the folks out there on how to best work with the energy associated with this time of year? Good question. You know, if you look at astrology, everything's kind of in cycles within cycles within cycles, right? And uh, so say we're looking at uh, the lunar cycle, which is one of our shortest, you know, there's that, that phase with the waxing moon where you're looking at kind of planting the seeds of growth during that period, you know, which you'll generally reap during the uh, full moon and then you go into the waning moon in which you're kind of like drawing in conclusions and, and, and collecting data from that period. And then you go out again. A lot of people are pretty much, you know, what would you say? Like unaware of, of this process in their day to day life. But if you look back on your life, I feel like you'd see cycles where, you know, you were highly productive. You did a whole bunch of stuff. You kind of, you know, you got to this phase and then you achieve this sort of like semi burnout where you're kind of sitting back and, 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 and recollecting, you know, and, and recovering from that phase. So, you know, that's the lunar cycle. We see the same thing in a larger extent with the actual like, you know, the year cycle. You know, the, the spring equinox is the time of, you know, Aries, Taurus, Gemini. This is a period where it's the same thing on a much bigger scale. Than the lunar phase, where this is the same 
period where we would want to plant our seeds, you know, literally in the sense of, you know, like certain hemispheres with actual planting, right? But uh, metaphorically in our own lives, this is the phase in which we, uh, we plant the seeds to go forward into the rest of the year. So like, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence, for example, that we had this whole theory in the modern world of the, the New Year's resolutions, right? Of course, it's just based on a BS calendar that has no relevance, but um, it's still one of those things where we kind of intuitively grasp the fact that at the beginning of any new year, it's the time to make new plans, make lists, make goals, you know, and, and then sort of, sort of like plant the seeds to start to, to reap some of those rewards, right? Like nobody's making, you know, a resolution to uh, get in shape in September, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you should make a resolution every day to get in shape, but that's just me. So, yeah, well, that's certainly true. But um, you know, as far as the spring, spring equinox goes, you know, on a on a on a fundamental level, and of course, it's going to depend heavily on each individual person because I can't look at all of their charts. There's going to be certain people who it works better for them at different times of year or what have you. But on the whole, the spring equinox period is typically a time in which people, you know, are planting the seeds that they're going to reap down the road. That's the most important thing to be thinking about. But yeah, you know what? You could do worse than just thinking along those lines all the time, right? Like uh, the the worst thing that I see on a, on a daily basis is uh, people who just make no plans, no goals ever, you know? I mean, they're working at 7-Eleven and, and that's, that's their life, right? Like they don't have any like plan to go beyond that. And there's nothing inherently wrong with working at 7-Eleven whatsoever, right? The, the, where you get into what's wrong is the fact that this is your life. You could, you could totally waste it, you know, just sitting right there, or you could make some kind of goal that you want to achieve, right? Like it's the difference between what you're getting in life and what you're getting out of life, right? Like your life is yours to, uh, to determine and you're the only one that has to experience it. So you kind of get to determine exactly like what goals you're going to meet and which, which ones you're just going to ignore. To boil that down into the spring equinox, I would say generally astrologically, spring equinox is one of the best times to set these kind of goals and really like make plans and uh, try and achieve them. Definitely, yeah. So I was thinking as you were talking too, is there such thing as a solar new year and a lunar new year? Because, you know, when you celebrate the new year in fucking January, it's very cold and it's very, you know, like moonlit. You know, it's got that sort of vibe to it, short days and, and whatnot. But I'm thinking like, you know, the, the solar new year, or at least the, the new year that I would like to recognize, you know, here in the spring, like it's obviously days are getting longer and sunnier. So is there such thing as solar new year and lunar new year? Well, you know what? That's getting into like a realm of like paganism. And I'm not personally a pagan, although I have pagan friends. And uh, I honestly don't know uh, like in depth a lot of the material about the equinoxes and the solstices, for example. But I do believe there's a historic basis for this, right? And of course, you know, one of the fascinating things about looking at it astrologically is it depends on where you're at, right? Like if you're in the Western Hemisphere, things are different than if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere, you know? Like, what we think of as summer is uh, entirely different than if we lived in Australia, right? So I think that that has a de uh, a determinative effect on people's lives and how, like, where you're actually born and where you make your, you know, your life, so to speak, it has a lot to do with when exactly you're, say, sowing your seeds versus reaping them and what have you. And um, the unfortunate truth, astrology and esotericism in general, is that most of the systems are incredibly personal in a way, right? Like, you know, I've met tons of people who are magicians, and of course, each one of them magic means something entirely different, right? There's no one truth. Astrology works the same way. I wish I could just write articles in which, you know, I could immediately address everyone's personal problem and solve all things for them. But uh, I can't do that. You know, I can um, I can look at things. Generally, I look at things from an American perspective. That's where I'm from. Uh, you know, a large part of my reading audience is from that hemisphere. That's just kind of a choice that I have to make. Right. Like I can't I could, for example, like break down horoscopes based on location, but uh, I, just, I don't have that kind of time, basically. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, as far as uh, lunar and solar New Year, I believe there's a historic basis for that. Although honestly, they, that's going outside of my realm of expertise, so I I, I don't want to BS you about it. Oh, that's completely fair, man. Thanks for that. And just one more thing on this. I saw something on Instagram that I thought was worth quoting here or worth sharing. I saw a post that said this, We are being pushed to purge out everything holding us back before the spring equinox. The season shift is a major timeline jump in in order to create physical realities that align with our destined paths. Many are being guided right now to release living locations and move or change careers, or end specific relationships in order to live out their true soul missions on Earth. Whatever is leaving, let it go. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. You know, looking at um, people's charts and things, there's like there's certain houses that uh, people are afraid of. For example, like the uh, eighth house, which is generally the house of death, but it's a lot like the death card in tarot, right? Like you're not looking at, sometimes it's literal death, but most of the time it's a metaphorical death. It's like a... Uh, You know, when you let's say you planted, you know, your seeds and then you reap, you know, there's a certain amount of chaff like that you have to slough off in the process. Right. Like everybody, I think, has experienced this in their lives. You know, there's a certain number of friends that you've had when you were when you were kids that later on you look back and you say, you know what, this person's not really helping me. Like they're nice people, but, you know, they're negative or, or or whatever. Like there's a metaphorical death there of change, right? Like change is a natural byproduct of growth and progression. Like it's one of those things that in the modern world in general, like, well, and I, I wouldn't even say the modern world. I think humans in general are somewhat afraid of change. Like I, I have no doubt that, you know, in the year 1000, they were just as afraid of change as we are today. You know, like there's a, uh, there's a safety aspect of, being in, you know, your element, you know, like being in your routine, your, your, your world that you understand. But the truth of it is, is that you can't progress that way. Like there's a certain amount of like, whenever you make a major progression in your life or you make, you know, you move towards your goals, there's going to be a certain amount of, of pushing involved, right? Like that quote, you're going to fall into a category in which there's no way around letting go of things in your past, right? Like even things that you really loved, you're going to have to let go of people and places and events and ideas that you once held, you know, inviolable. And it's just a natural byproduct. If you think the same way today that you did at 20, then you probably fucked up somewhere along the way. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, man. That's, that's a great point, actually. So let's pause this procession for just a minute and take a step back and talk about you you know, where in the story of Preston Gibbs did your universe open up and serenade your ear holes with the music of the spheres for the first time? So uh, that's a very well put question. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I'm not uh, incredibly different from your average person, which may actually lead my story more credence. You know, it's not like I was just always totally bizarre and like, you know, making magic circles when I was six or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. like for, for most people, I think like certainly when you're kids in my case, like I was only aware of astrology in the most like hippie sense growing up, you know, like I knew what sun signs were. I sort of knew when somebody said, Oh, I'm a cancer. I knew what that was, but it's not like I put any emphasis on that or even really grasped what they were talking about until much later. Like I took a very normal route for the most part, you know, I went to school, I did the, uh, you know, I was a big very big video game player, you know, uh, I'm a millennial. I was born in 1986. So of course, like from the moment, you know, by the time I was four, I had a Nintendo. So I had a very normal, I guess, quote unquote, American upbringing from that period in which, uh, you know, I experienced (laughs) like family ties and, uh, lots of, uh, super Nintendo and Nintendo games and, 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 and N64, and, you know, my favorite movies were like Schwarzenegger movies and stuff like that. It was, you know, and none of these things really kind of open you up to the esoteric, even though some of them have esoteric elements in them. They're just buried. It wasn't until, oh, I would say high school. You know, when I was in high school, the biggest game in town, for me anyway, was EverQuest, right? Like that was the mind boggling game that really like, mm-hmm. you know, before that, I never got to play with anything other than my local friends. And then you get to play something like that, and you're like, holy crap, I, you know, I have friends in Australia, I have friends in New Zealand, you know, like, it was uh, eye-opening. It didn't move towards the esoteric right away, but what it did was, you know, when you're 
interacting with a game like that, which is really trying to recreate a world, you know, like uh, from the Tolkien-esque sense, you're looking at like what they call today second world, you know, where you're essentially recreating a world that's much like our own, but different. It has certain different rules. That started kind of, you know, maybe that chipped the the wall a little bit with the idea that um, we could simulate this kind of thing, you know. And then when I got into college, I had been programming for years on the side as a kid. You know, I, I would uh, make money on the side, for example, programming stuff for the TI-83. You know, I figured out ways to cheat the system, so to speak. Like when I was in school, you know, we would have these TI calculators, which were, you know, they had the, you oh, could program yeah, yeah. in basic yeah, Texas Instruments, man. It was required in every math class I ever took. Yeah, and see, like, before we would take any tests, they, w- they would always go down the rows and they would make us um, show them the screen that showed that it had been erased, right? Like, so there was no secret programs or anything you had on there that could, like, do your, uh, <laughs> yeah. your test for you or whatever. So, of course, like, in a somewhat conny, ingenious way, which I look back on and kind of think, mm, you know, I was a weird kid. But I, uh, you know, I came up with a, a stupid little simple one that would just recreate that screen of saying that it had been cleared without actually being cleared, right? So you could just pull that up and then show it to them, they'd be, and they'd just assume that you'd wiped your TI. Of course, you hadn't. And then whenever the test came around, you had a program that would just, you know, calculate everything for you. So, you know, this is my first foray into programming, I guess you could say. And then when I got into college, you know, I originally went into literature, I wanted, to, I wanted to have an English degree, right? And then um, I got about a year, maybe a year and a half into that, and I realized all my professors are idiots. Like, uh, you know, they, they always had idiotic um, things to say about every short story we would read or whatever. And, you know, things are actually, like, provable wrong, right? Like, right. <laughs> you know, they, like I had one particular professor that everything was a biblical allegory for them, no matter what. Right. And I mean, you could even go to the author themselves if they were still living and they would, you know, have interviews about these things and say, no, this is not a biblical allegory. And yet you'd be wrong on the test if you said it was or it wasn't. Right. Got out of that thinking like, you know what, I don't need a piece of paper that tells me that I can write or that I can read whatever I want to read. Like I'll just do that. So I transitioned into computer science uh, because I was like, well, you know, if I, if I don't need a degree for that, you know, I could get a degree for programming because this is interesting. From there, you know, I continued on several years down the road, flash forward, so I'm not wasting everybody's time. You know, I would make little programs on the side. And uh, uh, I was a big video game player in my high school and college years. So, of course, I wanted to make one, right? And I had been, like, uh, imprinted with the early MMOs, like EverQuest, where I was really enamored with the idea of simulating a world so in the process of making, you know, a game myself that did this sort of thing, it started kind of opening my eyes to the fact that a lot of the stuff that I was simulating would apply, right? Like I would come in, I would come up to milestones or, or, or difficulties in it and I would think like, okay, well, I have to get this thing to happen and I don't know how to do it. So I would think about how it happens in real life and then extrapolate from there, right? I would say, okay, well... You know, how do I, me, you know, Preston know what I'm seeing and what I'm not? And how do I, how do I process that? And in the process that I would retroactively, or I guess, retro engineer like a solution within the system. And, you know, it didn't take very long, maybe, you know, a few months of that before I realized, well, I'm creating a world exactly like the one we live in that follows the same rule set. And uh, around that same time, I was a big science fiction reader. I'm still a big science fiction reader. And I read Philip K. Dick. And specifically, I read Philip K. Dick's Ballast, which if any listeners uh, are interested in Philip K. Dick, I would not advise you to start with Ballast. That is, uh, <laughs> that's one of his later works that is very complicated. But um, I loved that book. It really opened my eyes to a deeper philosophical view of life. Uh, he deals a lot with Gnosticism and a Gnostic viewpoint. And of course, that led me to people like Miguel Connor down the road. This all kind of like, like, like happens in your own life or anybody else listening to this. If you look back on a lot of the things that turned out to be important for you, it usually was like a ridiculous mix of things that just kind of like coalesced at a certain point. So all these things kind of coalesced for me. And I realized the world follows the same system as a simulation. 
And, uh, you know, if you look at the Gnostics and the Demiurge and, uh, you know, this, these concepts like this, like the world was created by somebody who either is not here anymore or is inherently evil in some way, you know, you start to piece things together. And somewhere along the way of that, of course, being inundated with a lot of programming, I realized that randomness cannot be created. You can simulate it, but you can't actually produce truly random things. And it made me think, hmm, this is the uh, limits of our technology. Like, we can't really recreate the real world because we can't recreate true randomness. But then in the process of thinking about that, I started thinking about the things in my life that seemed truly random, and I came up empty. Most of it just it was complexity that was making it seem random. So the more I looked at it, the more I thought, that's odd. Almost everything that's considered to be random today is actually just incredibly complex. It's complex to the extent that it seems random, but almost anything in your life, if you, it seems totally random. If you sit there and break it out for long enough, you'll eventually come up with a pattern. So this made me realize that our technology is not behind. Our concept of reality is behind. It's a deep conceit of the science world, for example, that they would discount something offhand, like astrology, that they've never been able to disprove, whereas they've never been able to prove or disprove true randomness, and then they accept, they accept that automatically without any uh, uh, pretense whatsoever. It's just assumed that uh, like certain things in our lives are random, even though we can't comprehend it. So all of this, you know, all, all this rambling tied together is the fact that somewhere along the way, I re-experienced astrology and experienced tarot for the first time. Specifically with tarot, I read a lot of Carl Jung and, uh, and his experiences with it were fascinating to me. Now, he writes remarkably little about the tarot, and yet he's one of the most famous writers about it because, <laughs> because you know, Carl Jung's well-known anyway, mm -hmm. and what he said about it was uh, fascinating. Long story short, uh, I re-experienced these things, and I'm looking at them with new eyes down the road and realize that they explain a world that doesn't have randomness, and therefore they seem to explain the world better than the way that we do in the modern world, because in my you know new understanding of it, there is no such thing as randomness. So that's pretty much catches you up to where I'm at now. That's uh, as far as uh, worldview goes. Yeah, astrology and tarot can simplify those complex patterns that, I mean, like once you learn astrology and tarot and you can combine them, which we'll talk about a little later here, they do, I think, simplify these these complex patterns. So, but you know, I am curious about your worldview because as you just outlined, you know, I heard you on the higher side chats last year, you know, talking a lot about the same thing, this simulation hypothesis, you know, my favorite analogy always is life as a video game. I've mentioned that on the show a few times and that's kind of what you're getting at here too. throw the matrix in there as well. But you also said to me in our email correspondence that that perception is reality and our thoughts are causal. So to me, those those two worldviews maybe contradict each other. I'm curious what you think of that. Like, do you think that thoughts are causal and the simulation hypothesis can coexist, or do you think that that they need to exist separately? I do, and I uh, I know we've talked about this before. Now, as far as the thoughts are causal thing, I would uh, any readers interested in the idea of that, I would point to Mitch Horowitz, which you've had on your show even recently who is one of the best to write about this particular subject. He wrote a book called uh, Occult America, and he wrote another book called uh, One Simple Idea. Both amazing. They should, uh, everyone should go buy it. But, <laughs> and I would add to that, I don't know Mitch personally, so I have no horse in this race. But um, as far as the two, I totally get where you're coming from with that. You know, on one hand, now, simulation theory is an interesting thing. There are a lot of people who would tell you that it's literally a program and we're living within it, right? Like Elon Musk, for example, has even uh, come out publicly talking about this and he's made interesting points, right? One of the points that he made that I had heard previous and I don't know where, but it was, uh, it was compelling to me too. It was one of the things that really opened my eyes to it is that you take where we are now, like, you know, I know you're a bit older than me around the same age. And, uh, you know, when we were growing up, the technology we had was a joke compared to what we have today, right? Like a lot of the video games were just text or, uh, you know, 8-bit. And, uh, you know, flash forward a, I consider myself young, a relatively short period of time. And uh, it's certainly in terms of the human race. And um, we suddenly have technology where we're getting pretty damn close to simulating reality as it is. I mean, you know, it's still noticeable as a video game. But if you look at 
Super Mario Brothers versus uh, whatever the new uh, shooter everybody's playing is. It's ludicrous how advanced it's become in that kind of time frame. So extrapolating that out from there, we can all assume, you know, looking at VR and AR that everybody's pushing now, we're moving towards a phase in the perceivable future, I would say within both of our lifetimes, that um, we're going to reach a phase in which it's the, the, the worlds we can simulate are indistinguishable indis- from the world that we actually live in. So it's as simple as saying, as far as the simulation theory goes, if that's true, then how much hubris would it take to assume that we're the first, right? Whoever gets there first is undoubtedly going to use that for research. They'll simulate worlds within worlds within worlds coming up, you know, trying to extrapolate information that's valuable to us today. Well, somebody did that. And the idea that we're the very first group to get there and simulate a world is incredibly, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to me. The chances are, you know, computed to be virtually zero. It's much more likely that we're one of the many simulations that's happened. We're not the original group. So that's simulation theory in a nutshell. I would say that I personally do not believe that it is necessarily we're in a server blade, for example. We're not, you know, I think whatever is going on here is beyond whatever current technology we have. We have no way to uh, comprehend it. But I would still say that the we're we're scratching the thumbnail surface of a lot of this stuff. We're just getting to the technological level where we're starting to comprehend the fact that worlds are not what we originally perceived them to be. And yeah. uh, of course, there's another interesting thing about that is if, if we are part of a simulation and they're simulating the entire universe or even a, a fraction of it, there's an interesting question there as to are we even the thing that is being simulated or are we just a byproduct of that process and they're looking at something entirely different, right? We may just be the bacteria growing on one particular planet that uh, it's totally irrelevant to whoever's looking. And I would preface that as well by saying, because I've gotten uh, weird emails about this after talking about it before, I'm not describing our world as a matrix type world in which we are locked in and could wake up. I would say that we are part of the system itself and there is no outside for us. We're not like bodies plugged into a different thing. We are the thing. In a sense, if this were a video game, you and I are NPCs. But um, anyway, sorry for that incredibly long. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute there. Wait a minute there. If we're NPCs, then who's playing the game? Well, and that's it. That's the question, right? I would say that, like, like I said before, I don't know that we're in a specific simulated game, so to speak. We're in something. And whatever that thing is, I'm not even entirely sure we're the main reason for it. But um, I would say... My example of this is astrology and tarot point to the fact that patterns are everywhere and there's no randomness, right? And that applies to us. So if that applies to the rest of the system, but also us, then we are there for the system as well, right? We're not the outsider plugging in, so to speak. There is no outside for us. There may be outside for some people. I have no idea. But um, as far as I'm concerned, most of humanity, if not all of it, are entirely encapsulated within the system itself. And that could be, you know, my, my best point of evidence to point to that is the fact that the same rules apply to us that apply to the rest of the system. If we can find patterns in our lives that seem to play out, you know, in lieu of whatever else is going on, then um, inevitably we are part of the system. We're not, we're not external and just experiencing it. Now, as to who is actually playing the game, I couldn't yeah. possibly tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like, you know, I view planets as, as you know, the, the, like the whole astrological basis of why astrology works. I view as essentially us experiencing a gigantic clock that we just have a, we've, we've collected a humongous data set over thousands of years of what is going on in these hands of the clock. And therefore that's how we found patterns in it. Of course, that leads you to the question, who is the clockmaker, right? Who is actually tending the clock? And to that, I couldn't tell you. If I could, I'd be a rich man. Yeah, and I would want to get in on that action too. So you wrote to me that, uh, I'm going to quote you here, you were far more deluged in what the ancients called fate than most today are willing to accept, but then the very nature of that means we're powerless to experience it in that way or do anything about it. What yeah. the hell do you mean by that? Can you elaborate on that? That was a good quote. I, I'd like to meet that guy. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that, so essentially anything that I've said here, whether it's simulation, you know, thoughts are positive, anything like this, you're not going to just walk away from this, you know, listening to this and, and like totally change your life, right? Like the life that you've been living up till now is still the same. So the experience you have with reality doesn't change whether or not you know like how reality functions, right? Like knowing what's behind the curtain does not preclude you from being involved in, in what's behind uh, what's in front of the curtain. Right. So my point to that is, so I'm a Hellenistic astrologer. You know, I, most of my techniques come from the Roman period, some of which from the medieval period in general, back then they did not really uh, stress about this sort of thing. They assumed everything was essentially predetermined and that their lives worked out in the way that they were supposed to work out. But other than their way of explaining themselves to us, it didn't change the way that they experienced it. They experienced it the same way we do now. So if the world is fated, and I say that it is, right? And I would preface fate because this is this gets into one of the things that people have the hardest time grasping, especially, well, I would say especially Americans. But actually, I mean, in these days, how much difference is there really between uh, the different dynamics of humanity? I would say that um, certainly as a, you know, I can only speak as an American best what I am. That's where I grew up. You know, I experienced American public uh, education. And oh, yeah. uh, sorry about that, man. <laughs> I know. Terrible. Uh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But uh, long story on that is, or short is that, uh, you know, in America, from the moment you're five years old on, you're inundated with this idea of total self-agency. Right. Like, I mean, because that's the way that we comprehend life. We, we comprehend it like when you when you sit down, and you make a decision. In your mind, it's always going to feel as though you made that decision totally separated from anything else, right? Like it's yours. You made it. But my point is that everything is faded or you could possibly use the word destiny, which sometimes people grok a little better. I don't know if you know the word grok. That's old school. Um, <laughs> Stranger in a strange land. Oh, man. Oh, man. Virtual high five. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, um, so destiny sometimes is a little easier to uh, swallow. But I would say that, you know, things are faded regardless, but they're not going to feel that way to you when you're living your life, right? Like you're going to feel like you have total agency. The difference is, is that you don't actually comprehend a lot of, a lot of like important detail, right? Like we think of time as linear. Like we think of, you know, like this is now and an hour from now is later. That's the future, right? And an hour previous to this, that was the past. But uh, of course, I don't see time that way. And I think we have plenty of evidence to suggest that that's not the way that time works. You know, that's the way that we comprehend it because we, uh, you know, whatever the nature is of our existence, uh, we have limitations, which we know, right? Like cats can see other waves of, uh, of light than we can, you know, cats can hear other things than we can. So we know that we're limited on our, our ability to perceive the world around us, right? So... I can hear to a certain level, but no more. I can see, you know, I can't see ultraviolet light. That'd be crazy if I could. That'd be pretty cool. But, uh, uh, you know, so like in the same way, we perceive time the way that we have to perceive time. We can't comprehend it. We can't grok it, right, in another way. And um, so while we perceive it as this is the present, then there's the future, and there's the past, I would say that the entire pie of time exists at all times. We're just experiencing a slice at a time. So because of that, say, for example, you decided, so this gets into the thoughts or causative thing. And uh, I don't know, uh, Mitch Horowitz may hate my explanation of this. I'm sorry, Mitch. But um, say, for example, you thought of you're going to lose weight, right? And then six months later, you've lost 50 pounds. And you look back and you say, thoughts are causative. I had thought of losing weight, and I did, right? But to my viewpoint, I would say, how do you know that you weren't just reaching a slice of that pie in which you were going to lose weight and therefore the idea of losing weight popped into your head? Like, how do you know that your idea of losing weight was totally your own and not just a simple fact of you're moving to that phase and therefore that you begin thinking about it? So I'm curious then, how does this worldview inform your understanding of the machinations of astrology and tarot? good question. I would say that it blends very well with the idea. Let me preface this for a second, because I am one astrologer and tarot reader. There are many. 
and I am not speaking for all. There are plenty of astrologers and tarot readers that would disagree with this point, and that's totally fine. It's a, you know, it's a part of human experience that we don't have like a one agreed upon method for anything, whether you're writing a book or making a movie or anything else. And thank God for that, because if every movie was like a Michael Bay movie, I would stop watching movies. They're very boring. So while I'm saying that, for example, everything is heavily faded, you can and will certainly find out astrologers who did not share this viewpoint whatsoever. You know, it is hotly contested in astrology, especially here recently with the, uh, major resurgence of the ancient techniques like Hellenistic astrology and medieval astrology. There are plenty of astrologers you can go to who will tell you that everything is total free will, everything is total self-agency, and that you can essentially usurp the negative things in your natal chart if you put in the right kind of effort. Now, I'm not one of those people. I'm just, I, I, you know, I want to make well clear that I'm not disparaging those people or the people who believe in that. I just have personally, uh, when working with clients and things like this, experience that that is rarely the case. Everyone has weaknesses and everyone has strengths, and those are more or less set. It's rare that somebody who is a terrible public speaker suddenly becomes an incredible one. Or, you know, somebody who's a natural introverted personality who thinks a lot, you know, they live in their head, they're, they live the life of the mind. They don't suddenly stop doing that and live an incredible extroverted life. Now, you can learn techniques to soften your edges, so to speak, but you'll never get rid of the basic elements that make you, you. And that gets back to some of the fate as well, right? Like how much, how much fate is untouchable, for example, like how much of it can you not possibly move? And I'm not sitting here telling you that if you sit on the couch and do absolutely nothing, your life will play out identically. I'm saying that if you sit on the couch and do nothing, that was faded. You were automatically pre like that was what you were going to do there, and you had no uh, self agency in that in that instance. But um, at the same time, it's hard to grok again. Going back to something we we had just discussed about the idea that you don't have the level of control that people experience normally, you know. But again, you're going to experience it as though you do. If everything is played out automatically, say you're a player on the stage, you know, of life, so to speak, to borrow a bit of Shakespearean metaphor, you're still going to experience that stage as the whole thing. That's the whole pie. You're not going to go out on that stage and know that you're an actor playing a part. Your part is you and your character is you and you're powerless to do anything about that. Now, that sucks for a lot of people to grasp because they take that to mean that they're doomed. And that's not what I'm saying. For example, you know, I'm not saying, and that's the reason why I like to sometimes weave in the idea of destiny rather than fate. There are some things that are automatically predetermined and it becomes, it comes out of the things that make you, you, right? Like you're good at certain things, you're bad at other things. And that is where some of your fate comes from. Now you can rally against this to some extent. And I'll tell you, there's a really good way of knowing if you are, if you are living your life and you are incredibly depressed or feeling like you are in a really negative space or going in the wrong direction, guess what? You're not living your destiny, right? Like there's a certain, like how many people, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but I I personally know many people who, for example, have really good jobs, getting really good pay, everything about their life, in essence, is going well, right? But they're unhappy. You know, they would rather be a novelist or whatever. And then yet they're working a day job as a uh, accountant or, or what have you. Plenty of people would be totally happy with this accountant's life. They're making, say, 100K plus a year. You know, they got their wife, they got their kids, they got their nice house, you know, everything's paid off, everything's going well. But they don't, feel fulfilled, right? And to me, in a lot of ways, when I've seen this myself, this is the experience of those who go against what uh, their their base instincts are. They're living a different life. So in a sense, they've usurped fate, but with extreme existential pain in the process. And I feel like I've gone off on an incredibly weird tangent. So what was your original question? (laughs) I just asked you how the worldview that you have informs your understanding of astrology and tarot. Okay. So, wow. How did I get so far off the the track on that? Um, No, but hey, it's it's not bad stuff. It's enjoyable. (laughs) So astrology and tarot, 
essentially, you know, work out of a worldview in which everything is in a pattern, right? When you sit down with the tarot reader and they flip out, you know, whatever their spread of cards is, whatever their particular technique is, and I would say this is irrelevant. This is something that a lot of us tarot readers, for example, will spend too much time thinking about. What is their particular technique? What is their particular spread? I would say that's totally uh, irrelevant. What actually happens as you, the experiencer of this tarot reading, you look at the cards, you look, you know, there's this, there's a level of semiotics that goes into this. You look at the pictures, you look at the words and you bring your experience into it. So, if, you know, to invoke the Christopher Nolan movie, gosh, what is that movie where um, everybody is uh, in a dream? Oh uh, yeah. Inception. So to invoke Inception for a moment, right? Like in that movie, they are uh, creating a dream. And then when people go into it, they fill it with their secrets. So that's actually essentially, in my experience, how tarot works. I lay out a set of cards. I may have whatever comprehension of those cards I have brought, right? But the, the experiencer who I'm reading for, they are the ones that bring their life experience and, and their questions, their problems. They bring that with them and they fill the cards with meaning, right? So when I look at the moon or look at the star, I may think of basic ideas about what those cards are said to represent, right? But that doesn't matter. What matters is what the querent brings to the cards. And when you explain the basics of what you're looking at, they will almost without you know exception trigger on that in some way and it will mean something specific to them. So to the skeptic, this is called the, the P.T. Barnum effect, right? The idea of somebody brings specific, like they draw specifics out of generalities, right? And so this is in a, uh, in a sense, this is what cold readers do. You know, if I look at you and just based on the way you're dressed, the way that you do your hair and things like that, I can say certain aspects about your life. That's cold reading. Right. And that's the negative explanation that a lot of critics have for tarot. But I would say, for example, yes, the P.T. Barnum effect does exist. People will bring specifics into generalities. There's a certain number of people who will read their newspaper horoscope and feel like they're speaking directly to them. But I would say that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's how you experience life every day. When you hear the door open and you look up and you see somebody, you assume they went through the door. You actually have absolutely no idea if they did or not. That is, uh, you know, inductive reasoning. You're making solid assumptions that are most likely to be correct. But that doesn't mean, you know, that they're based in some kind of objective truth. So tarot and astrology work in a worldview in which there, everything is patterns that can be found. There is no thing in our existence that does not follow a pattern. So in my worldview... It rocks perfectly with the idea of the fact that there's no true random because, of course, astrology, for example, if there were true random, then astrology wouldn't work or it would work some of the time. And that doesn't seem to be the case in my experience. More often than not, especially if they're using the right technique, they tend to come out correct over and over and over again. And to me, you know, it goes way past the metric, the, like the, the experience of random a chance, right? Like I don't, I'm not right 50% of the time. I'm right a lot more than that. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is the fact that there is no true random. The world that we live in is an entirely pattern-based world. If you examine your life, I guarantee you, you will find patterns over and over and over and usually patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns. And it is very compelling to me that the astrological basis for a lot of these techniques follows that same method. They expect patterns within patterns. Again, going back to, yes, we have the spring equinox, but we also have the lunar cycle that goes within that equinox. And both of them tend to play out in a similar pattern, just in different phases, right? So they pretty much gel perfectly with that worldview in the sense that everything is patterned out. And the reason we don't experience it that way is life is complex as hell. Like, if you add enough complexity to something, it will feel random. But that doesn't mean it is, right? Like, if I flip a coin five times and write that down, it's unlikely that that's going to seem like anything other than random, right? I mean, I may have just flipped five heads. At most, I'll look at that and think, wow, 
this coin is bullshit. You know, but mm-hmm. the difference here is that if I flip that coin 10,000 times and wrote it down every time, patterns emerge. And that's a fact, right? Like there's nothing in your life. If you repeat the same thing enough times, you'll find that patterns emerge everywhere. That's the whole number 23 thing and, and what have you. And uh, of course, yeah, if you go looking for something, you'll find it. They would point to that. And I mean, by they, maybe the, the modern scientific community, they would point to that and say, well, this person is unhinged, right? <laughs> They're looking for the number 23 and they see it over and over again. Or every time they look at a clock, they, you know, they register 1111 and they think, well, that's odd. Why do I keep seeing 1111? And then they say, oh, well, that's a confirmation bias. You look at the clock all the time and you only remember when you see 1111. I, on the other hand, would say, yes, maybe that is confirmation bias the way that they say it. But I would also say patterns exist and we register them the way that we want to register them. So when you keep experiencing the same number or what have you, and of course, like using young and uh, modern occultism, we would call it synchronicity. I would say this is the very basis of synchronicity. The reason why astrology and tarot gel with this worldview is because they show patterns in the world we live in. I say that the world is entirely pattern based and therefore synchronicity exists as well. You know, when you think certain things, you know, you may think about, you know, to use the uh, repo man uh, example, you think about plate of shrimp and then somebody says plate of shrimp or shrimp, right? Like, yeah, um, yeah. who hasn't experienced that in their life? I certainly have. And sometimes you actually like, you know, have to step back and you're like, whoa, what the hell's going on? here? You know, as a science fiction fan, this reminds me of the novel Pattern Recognition by William Gibson. Have you ever read that? I actually have that. I have not read it all the way through. I'm not a huge Gibson fan. He's a, uh, I read Neuromancer. I love Gibson uh, early on, but he's kind of gone off on a, like his style is, is a little bit mm-hmm. uh, abrasive to me, but um, I do have that book. I, I've been meaning to read it for a while. Yeah. I'm not sure why I thought, I mean, I, I guess I know why I thought of it because we're talking about pattern recognition essentially. <laughs> and it's one of the books that I've, it's, I haven't read all of his stuff. I've only read probably, three or four books of his, but that was one of them. And I just remember the theme of, of the book there is it syncs up nicely with our conversation. So I just thought maybe you had read that too. Yeah, I've read some of his stuff and I did get that mostly, for, you know, just it, if nothing else for the title. Cause I was, again, you know, just right. like you're saying, man, pattern recognition. I mean, that is essentially the world we, we're experiencing. That's how, that's the uh, basis of how we experience the world. But, um, no, I read his early stuff, and I'm not a huge cyberpunk guy, you know? I mean, that was like an mm-hmm. 80s thing, and I guess if I were, you know, 10, 20 years younger, that would have been mind-boggling to me. But, of course, you know, growing up, you know, in the 90s and reading books about the future of the internet and experiencing the internet in the 90s, it was a weird, you know, a disconnect of thinking like, oh, well, they're, you know, like, uh, gosh, who's uh, Neil, is it Neil Stevenson that writes uh, Snow Crash? Yep. That was a big one too, you know, like the uh, the idea of this virtual world and, and everything in it. And then, of course, you know, in the 90s, you're experiencing the internet where it takes 20 minutes to load a bitmap and <laughs> everything blows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like the cyberpunk thing didn't hit me as much. You know, I like the older uh, 50s and 60s guys that were more philosophical. I loved Phil Dick. You know, a lot of Phil Dick fans, they consider his early work his best stuff, you know, when he was still kind of, gosh, what would you call it? Like that golden age science fiction-y kind of thing. Yeah, kind of pulpy, right? Yeah, pulpy, definitely. That's a perfect word for it. I liked it better when he got older, right? And, it, and like, it's funny because a lot of his contemporaries call that period when he kind of like went on, you know, he went off the edge and he got too crazy. But I actually like that his book's best because he starts getting so philosophical, you know, after his uh, experience with, uh, gosh, what was his friend, uh, Bishop Pike? Yeah. Um, can't remember if he was... Uh, Episcopalian or, or what he was exactly, but uh, yeah, he made friends with him and started getting more and more into religion, you know, and uh, and in his experience of religion, he started getting into you know specifically Gnosticism and all these different things. And he wrote like uh, to any of the listeners out here that that sounds even remotely interesting, go pick up some Philip K. Dick stuff. He obviously understood the worldview that I'm talking about, although maybe not consciously, and he just talks about it all the time. And his later books are incredible. Scanner Darkly is amazing. Ubik, which is one of his earlier works, is amazing. Again, again, talking about people existing in a world that's essentially a fabrication. And uh, Vallis was uh, one of the all-time favorites. I know you interviewed his his widow, Tessa. Mm -hmm. 
that was an awesome, awesome interview. I love that. Yeah, thanks, man. Tessa's a, a pretty a pretty interesting gal herself, too, just aside from the fact that she used to be married to one of our favorite authors. But yeah. So oh, yeah, definitely. I don't want to like disparage Tessa by saying that like she's only, you know, interesting as as she relates to Philip K. Dick. She's actually pretty interesting herself. She's written like, like she wrote Firebright, which is actually about mm-hmm. Philip K. Dick, but it's very yeah. good. No, very, very, very good interview. I I envy you being able to talk to her. Well, she's actually pretty accessible, man. I mean, if you had Facebook, you could probably talk to her all the time. So, you could be one of those uh, weird fans that just, you know, <laughs> just shows up on her doorstep you know, like oh, with like man. a bunch of random Philip K. Dick paperbacks in my hand and be like, yeah. "Oh my god." And uh, yeah, I'm sure she would love that. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. I'm not sure, but yeah. yeah maybe, maybe not that. I, yeah. <laughs> so, along these same lines, you wrote an article recently about astrology and tarot correspondences. This is a topic that popped up in a chat I had recently with the ladies from the Fortune's Wheelhouse podcast. I don't know if you've heard that podcast, but we didn't get too deep into those correspondences. But if you don't mind, I'd like to dig deep into those correspondences between astrology and tarot. And I guess a good place to start is with the four classical elements and how those correspond to both astrology and tarot. Yeah, so of course, you know, obviously that was interesting to me. You know, as soon as I came across that thinking, oh, here's an interesting... Like, I like tarot. I like astrology. Here's a uh, interesting way to meld the two. You know, there's the basic correspondences. Like, you know, you're looking at the basic four elements, the Greek elements. If you look at water, for example, of course, cancer is a, you know, a water sign, for example. And the cups in tarot represent water. You know, the swords represent air. And you'd be looking at Gemini and things like this for air, right? You know, there's three uh, astrological signs for each element. And there's a uh, tarot uh, suit, I guess you could say, for each element. And specifically, the article you're talking about, I drew a lot on uh, Lon Milo Duquette's work, which I would, again, suggest any listener who's interested in the tarot or anything like what we're talking about, look up Lon Milo Duquette, amazing writer. He wrote a book fairly recently that I think is called Understanding the Thoth Tarot, and that is a amazing book. If you're interested in tarot and you haven't experienced a Thoth deck, or you don't, uh, or you maybe you're afraid of it because it's uh, tied to Aleister Crowley. I would certainly suggest look into Duquette's book. And you will find that it is much more accessible than you expect. So, long story short, about that um, article you're discussing, it is about, and I believe it is coming out in the next issue of the Cardamancer. I'm not sure. I have to talk to the editor on that. But uh, yes, subscribe to the Cardamancer, and you will find this article. And I have a much more rudimentary version on my website called uh, Timing Techniques with Tarot. So what the basics of it is the idea that through tarot, you can actually time events. And uh, the reason I got interested in that is because I read tarot for clients, right? And it's not long into reading tarot for clients before you come in, you know, you come to a situation in which you say to a client that such and such will happen. Or, you know, such and such a type of event is likely to come up in their life soon. And they say, when, right? And the second they say, when, the average tarot reader is like, well, shit, I don't know. A uh, soon? So there's actually a interesting timing technique that Duquette writes about. And uh, several others, actually. You know, I mean, he's taken this uh, essentially from Crowley and other writers before him. And he does it in a very good way, which is also what I've tried to achieve. I've tried to explain things in my articles in a way that can be accessible without having to go back and read book upon book. Basically, so when they ask when, for example, there are techniques within tarot that can dis- discern exactly when. And they, they do link up astrologically. And I don't have the chart that I made for this right in front of me to give examples. But different cards can coincide with certain tarot uh, with certain astrological signs or even just periods as odd as that might sound if you accept the fact that the world is full of patterns then this is just a, yet another pattern and in my personal experience it works remarkably well you can find for example you know with the question at hand that it's going to happen on a wednesday or it's going to happen in the summer and this can be you know seemingly ridiculous to the querent at the time but i can't tell you how many emails i've had you know vastly after the fact of a particular reading where people are you know freaking out and saying oh my god you said this is going to happen like on a thursday in in march and it 
and if it happened today and it's Thursday in March, you know, and it's just like mind boggling to them. You know, the reason why it is, is not because I'm some kind of like uh, exceptional genius or anything like that, because believe me, that is not the case. Uh, I'm not a psychic or have any special skills whatsoever other mm -hmm. than just having learned this stuff. The difference is, is that their worldview doesn't explain the fact that things could, could predict what's going to come up. And uh, mine does, right? Like to me, it's not surprising at all when things happen down the road that I knew were going to happen and then they, they play out. And maybe it's uh, you get a rush of, wow, I can't believe it happened that way or holy shit, I knew that this was going to happen. And yet I, you know, I was totally unaware of it in the moment until after the fact. And I thought, wow, that's insane. But yeah, it's incredibly compelling to people. So it's essentially the same way as when somebody experiences a hypnotist or a magician, right, where they know they're going to pull a trick on them. And then, then when they do the trick, they're totally blown away and they say, uh, you know, like, I can't believe that happened or, you know, I have no idea how that worked. And the truth is, of course, the difference between the two is with magicians, for example, we take it for granted that whatever they're doing is not breaking the laws of physics, right? They, they're not uh, some kind of superhuman who is totally destroying, you know, Newtonian laws in the process. But with astrologers, it's a little different. Sometimes people come into that and expect them to somehow be like a higher order mystics or something like that. It's essentially the same thing. The difference is, is that their worldview, they're coming into that does not encapsulate whatever like the technique the uh, magician used to do a card trick or whatever that blew their mind. So it still works. It's just phenomenal to them because in the world as they understand it, it's uh, majestic in some way or uh, incredible. And uh, that's not to disparage card magicians or anything like that because I love them. <laughs> so could you give us some examples of how maybe – astrological things like the Deccans coincide with certain tarot cards? Well, I'll tell you what. With the Deccans, and I don't know a lot about them, you really want to go to Austin Coppock. Anyone listening to this, go pick up, you know, if you're interested in the Deccans, pick up Austin Coppock's book. I can't remember what it's called. That's uh, called 36 Faces. Faces, yeah. Amazing, yeah. right? I don't know if yeah. you've read it. No, I don't know nearly as much as Austin on that. I can That's kinda, fine. Let I, me rephrase that question then. Is there a good example of astrological correspondence in tarot from a major arcana card that people might be familiar with? I don't know how much the listeners know about tarot. The average tarot deck is uh, separated by major and minor arcana. And this does have an interesting uh, correlation with what I've been talking about because uh, a lot of tarot readers, and myself included, believe that minor arcana essentially coexist with what is currently like mundane in your life. For example, like these are things that happen in your day-to-day life. Major arcana, on the other hand, almost represent a divine influence in between that. So, for example, like a major arcana card, like the devil or the sun or things like this, if you get these in a spread and a reading, they're going to be different than if you got like the three of cups or something like this, right? If you got a minor arcana card, which to the listeners, that is the suits and the court cards, you know, the cups, the swords, uh, that would be minor arcana. And the major arcana is all the ones that are well known, like the star and the devil, the lovers, you know, these kinds of things. Um, if you get minor arcana in a reading, you are most likely uh, dealing with things that you can control and are part of your daily life. If you get major arcana, on the other hand, you are going to get, for example, something that goes above and beyond your daily life. This is something that you may not have as much control over. So this gets into the confusion between what is fate, right, and what is something else. Like, this wouldn't be confusing at all to the classic the classic Greeks or, or anybody like that who perceive the world to uh, exist in a situation where the gods are, uh, you know, heavily a part of our everyday life. So to them, this would just be a part of their life that's being influenced by the gods rather than themselves. And this is harder in the modern world where most people are, I think the majority of the world these days is either atheistic or basically atheistic, religion and name only, for example. 
And uh, so for most of them, they believe in total self-agency where everything that they do and everything that they experience has to do with like choices they make and their friends make and what have you. So major arcana would exist outside of this. This is generally things that you have no control over. They're almost always external. They're going to come from, you know, out of nowhere. Now, as far as astrological correspondence with these, I did make a chart on this fairly recently when I wrote that article, but actually I do not have that chart in front of me. But there is one, if I could pull out Lon Milo the Ket's, uh, you know, understanding the Thoth tarot, I would be able to tell you more about that. But because I believe he did have a similar chart on the same kind of thing. But uh, basically, every card in the tarot actually corresponds with different things. Like, for example, like I said before, right, the cups represent the element of water, and uh, so do Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, right, which are water signs. Um, For example, discs are Earth, and you could compare those with Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo. Uh, And then you get into other things like the cardinal, the fixed, and the mutable signs, right? And this uh, gets into more complex astrology, but basically, like, long story short, like, like fixed signs, for example, are Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, and Taurus, Right. And each one of those you'll notice is a different element. You know, Leo is fire, Scorpio is water, Aquarius is air and Taurus is earth. Right. So they each correspond with a different, a different suit, you know, wands, cups, swords and discs. So if you're looking at, for example, let's say you drew, you know, a cup card. Let me think. Uh, Let's say you drew the queen of cups, for example. Right. The court cards kind of exist uh, astrologically in a little more than the minor cards. Right. In the, uh, which is exactly to the point that I made earlier. So the major arcana kind of exists outside of the normal experience. Minor arcana exists within. Court cards are kind of in between. So uh, whereas a minor arcana card, like say the Seven of Cups, would represent, you know, something like uh, that. Usually represents the third quarter of Scorpio, which getting into Austin Coppock's realm, that would be the third decan of Scorpio. If you drew, say, the Queen of Cups, for example, that represents three decans, and they always kind of overlap with these signs. So the Queen of Cups would start in Gemini, it would start in the, the last third of Gemini, but it would overlap in the first two thirds of Cancer. So, for example, if you are looking for something and saying, you know, I want to know when it happens, it's going to happen in that phase. And, uh, you know, there are other aspects of this as well, like if you draw an ace they are usually taken to be part of a, a a season for example you would use this to determine whenever the question at hand is uh, going to come up somebody asks when this is going to happen you can draw from the tarot deck and say this is going to happen in summer this is going to happen you know in the first two thirds of cancer right the reason why that works again goes back to my worldview in which everything's a pattern Yeah, well, I mean, there's plenty more in the article itself. So, yeah, I mean, we should just, I guess, push people to the article to to read it and and see the chart and how you break it down because I I thought it was pretty cool. The beautiful thing about stuff like that is, of course, when you're writing an article, you can just collect, you know, all this data and piece it together. (laughs) You're talking off the cuff a lot of the time. You're like, "Uh, I know what this is, but I would have to pull it up. Right, right. So I got one more question for you, man. I had a conversation recently with Dr. Carolyn Elliott about the Pluto and Scorpio generation, the millennials, which we are both part of. I listened to some of that uh, uh, interview. Very, very good. I loved it. Well, thanks, man. You know, we get a bad rap sometimes, unfairly, obviously. But as a millennial and as an astrologer, how have you seen the astrology industry change because of our generation? Well, this goes back to a change in the generational interest, I guess you could say. You know, I've used this in the past, and I hate, again, to go into another thing that's specifically American, because it's not really. But I've used this as an example of uh, the American dream, right? Like, so if you look at the baby boomer generation, they pretty much encompass exactly what we think of as the American dream, right? The 2.5 kids, the white picket fence, the, this whole thing. And uh, the Gen Xers kind of did the same thing. You know, they started off on a, on a different tangent, but they pretty much fell in line after a while. Uh, but the millennials are different. And uh, the reason why the millennials seem to be different is they grew up in a radically different world. The world that you and I grew up in, for example, is not nearly as isolated or, or fenced off as it was for the baby boomers. You know, to me, there's not a huge 
I have a difference between me here in Texas at this exact moment or England, right? Like I could phone up England right now. Not that you couldn't with baby boomers, but you'd pay out the ass with your mm-hmm. long, uh, long distance phone bill. You know, today that is not the case. Uh, we're experiencing a phase and we've experienced it as we grew up with more and more you know, shrinking of the distance between these uh, so-called boundaries. Also, at the same time, as I grew up, for example, I experienced Columbine. You know, I experienced 9-11. I experienced all of these shocking events in which the things that were guaranteed as safe and secure and what have you don't hold up. And uh, if you're looking at the baby boomer generation's version of the American dream, essentially what they were chasing after was security, was protection, right? And I don't think it's a coincidence today that as uh, a lot of millennials don't really seem to be touting the same principles. You have a lot of old school boomers and Gen Xers who are freaking out about the current state of the world and just want more guns, more protection, more police, what have you. And I don't see a lot of millennials doing that. If anything, millennials are much more suspicious of the police and everything to do with them. So the difference is, is it's a, it's a change in societal understanding. For the boomers and the Gen Xers, they grew up in a world in which they were pretty much safe to do as they wanted. And they essentially wanted, you know, what old philosophers like John Locke and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who helped essentially found the idea behind the American Declaration of Independence, the idea that a government exists as a, a social contract that we make between uh, ourselves as individuals and the government, where... I'm going to give a certain percentage of my rights. And in exchange, uh, all my other rights will be protected, right? I'll be guaranteed to pursue happiness or whatever particular thing that I'm trying to do. And so like the boomers really grasped onto that. They believed that they were essentially protected to go after whatever they want. This ignored the fact that what they want was being manipulated at all turns. But (laughs) uh, essentially... They would go after what they wanted, which they believed was a house and 2.5 kids and a new car. So millennials grew up in this in this society. I don't know about you. I certainly grew up in a household where my parents were embodied this. They trusted in, you know, corporate interests to take care of them. You know, they, they trusted in the fact that, uh, oh, you know, the company they worked for, the pension and the 401k, well, that would take care of everything as long as they, you know, did right by them they would be able to live life on the weekends and everything else would be taken care of, right? Mm-hmm. Well, millennials, for the most part, don't seem to think this way. I certainly don't. We've been exposed to a different phase of life in which every aspect as we grew up was slowly dismantled. First off, we grew up in, like most of us grew up in household, this exact dream was realized and it was ass. You basically grew up in a world in which they achieved every single aspect of this and they were very disappointed. They were very unhappy. And at the same time, we grew up in a world in which all along the way, things that were taken as were taken for granted, like, you know, you should be able to fly safely. Well, no, you can't do that, right? You should be able to go to school safely. No, you can't do that either. All of these connections, all of these safety protocols that they're guaranteeing in lieu of the rights they're giving up, those don't hold up. They can't actually protect them, right? They're, they're uh, a beautiful illusion. The idea that uh, everything's taken care of as long as you give up these certain things, those things are guaranteed and you get to have the rest. You know, you can, you can quote unquote, go after what you want. That turns out to not be true. Millennials are no longer interested in this idea of protection or safety because they've kind of seen that to be uh, as hollow as it's turned out to be. They're more interested in freedom. And uh, so this is actually, not only does this have to do with astrology and tarot, it has has to do with the right occult culture. There's a sudden trend of, science and questioning, you know, these uh, ridiculous things that we're told in public school, which uh, you knows today is to be at least uh, heavily redacted. The same thing is true with uh, science and everything else. And millennials seem to be very interested in freedom, freedom to question authority, freedom to pursue for interest, and in general, freedom from this kind of like a oppressive protection that we sold into generations ago that's now become imprisoning. It's a natural byproduct of anything that we take protective that it eventually becomes imprisoning. So that's essentially what happened in the past. They gave up, you know, and it's not like it's just in the past. Hell, we're experiencing it right now with uh, the Patriot Act, for example, right, where we, you know, willingly gave up 
a lot of freedom in exchange for this uh, so-called protection. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't actually experienced any of the protection. I mean, we're supposed to, but, uh, you know, it seems like airports are exactly as dangerous. Uh, now, this may be uh, looking back nostalgically, but uh, I feel like school at that time, other than Columbine, nobody could really name a high school shooting, right? Today, we exist in a in which it happens 30 or 40 times a year. I mean, you're talking about almost on a weekly basis. To say that you know schools are a safe day is laughable. I mean, it's ridiculous. Of course they're not. In my mind, they're one of the most dangerous places. Like, I don't hear nearly as many uh, shootings at Subway, safer at Subway than I am at a, a high school, which is preposterous. I think that that gets to the, the you know the absolute bones of why millennials have swapped. You know, the, the, we're talking about in a sense the metamorphosis of the dream from protection to freedom. Uh, they sold for protection that came imprisoning, and now uh, millennials are looking to shake that off. The American dream is the exact opposite. Uh, they're trying. Their American dream today is in essence escaping the American dream yesterday. year. And uh, why, you know, do I think that has a connection between uh, why astrology, tarot, and, you know, magic, the wider occult subjects have become uh, more important? Yes, absolutely. And again, that is, that is not limited to America. I think people in our generation are much more interested in questioning authority, questioning what they've been told is fact. And in general, just kind of like going their own way, right? And there's nothing better than that than the occult. That's a great answer, man. And I have to apologize to the listeners because our connection here all of a sudden has gotten really uh, choppy and poor. And uh, But we are towards the end of our time anyway, so it's probably a good time to call it. Preston, please do tell people where they can find more of you and your work. Uh, well, so mainly I'm on Twitter. You can find me on uh, at Preston Astro. Uh, you can also find me on my website, which is liminalastrology.com. And uh, that's about it. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for your time, man. Thanks so much for the conversation. Really appreciate it. And again, my apologies for the connection here, but thank you for your time for real. I do appreciate it. You're a good dude. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. Definitely want to have you back soon to talk more about this and maybe some more about science fiction. That sounds great. Thank you very much for having me on, Ryan. I really enjoyed this. Here, here, and cheers to a new year full of new energies and new experiences. My thanks again to Preston Gibbs. Liminalastrology.com is the place to be if you want more of his astrology and tarot, which is hard to rhyme with. The options are quite narrow, like tombs of Egyptian pharaohs or migratory paths of sparrows. Not swallows, unless they're African or European, but definitely not Caribbean. Like those pirates, which actually is hard to rhyme with. Unless we go back to that Jack Sparrow, which brings us back to tarot. I am quite lame. Anyway, I sure do enjoy that life as a video game analogy, or simulation theory, or the Matrix, or whatever you want to call it. And it makes sense that tools and practices rooted in pattern recognition would be able to crack the code, so to speak, of whatever it is that's actually going on in us and around us. That's why I'm drawn to both astrology and tarot, because every time I've had a reading, be it of the stars or of the cards, I have walked away rather humbled because the message always resonates with me and reinforces the idea that fate is real and working in our favor at all times. I don't know what all of it actually means big picture, but on a personal level you could do worse than plotting your one verse to the rhythm of that cosmic beat. And speaking of beat, we haven't skipped a single one over at Patreon. Patrons now have two episodes of Oculture Raw to digest, the latest of which was with my friend Truthseeker. He's an esoteric hip-hop artist, author, and speaker, and is also the host of the Truthseeker podcast, a weekly show that discusses spiritual, esoteric, and metaphysical topics. We chat about growing up on hip-hop music, life in the Deep South, real-life true detective stories, and backwoods Louisiana churches. That's something. We also talk about warlocks, angels, demons, aliens, UFOs, elemental spirits, the Bible, creativity as God, true alchemy and the work of jordan maxwell who i would love to get on the show here those raw episodes are for patrons contributing five dollars or more a month so if you're interested check out patreon.com slash culture and i have to give a shout out to our newest patron over there william much love to you man thanks for the support and much love to each and every one of you out there whether it's a dollar or a download you guys make the time i put into this so worthwhile but my time is up for this week do not worry though fate will bring us back together soon until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you 
to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.